seminar committee. I'd like to welcome you all to see the seminar of our boss, Dr. Rory Sackton Hamilton. Now, I'd like to call Dr. Kenneth McNally, our senior scientist, to do the proper introduction. They've been together forever, I think. <laughs> so, Ken. So, thank you, Mal. It's my pleasure to introduce Rory's background to you. He's the, as already described, he's the head of our uh, Genetic Resources Center. He obtained all of his education at University of Cambridge in the UK, a BA in 1975 in Natural Sciences, followed by his MA in Applied Biology in 1977, and his PhD in 1980 working on the genetic diversity of Tripolium. After that, he served as a consultant with IPCRI uh, several times, uh, postdocs at University of Wales. Um, he was the head of uh, the B gene bank for uh, gen uh, genetic resources and breeding at SEAT, and then moved to uh, the Institute for Grassland and Environmental Research in Wells, where he was from 1990 to 2002, at which time he joined us at Erie. And as research highlights, all of his career has been spent working on genetic resources, which is the topic that he will be uh, describing to us today. So, adventures in the world of rice diversity, an update on our very important gene bank. Thank you. Rory? exciting adventures, some adventures that we prefer not to have had, frankly, but I'm going to try and take you through most of them, not all of them, which means I, I skip over an awful lot of things to try and cover all the ground. And I hope to give you just a flavor of the kind of things we've had to deal with. Here, this, just as a reminder of it, that 12th of December 2012 was the 35th anniversary of the construction of our Newton Town store back in 1977. I wanted to say, st I wanted to start by saying that rice is incredibly diverse. And unfortunately, that's exactly how Bob started his seminar just last week. So I've had to think of a different way of showing how diverse it is. I can't see many Africans. Room. Yes, there's one from Sudan, one from, I'm not sure what the rule of that. But we know now that Africa is the center of diversity of humans. We think of the human species as being really diverse. We celebrate all the differences between us. And we think rice is inbred, and inbred means it's not very diverse. But actually, it's exactly the other way around. Rice is way more diverse than people. People are so inbred, it's almost indecent. And we have to pity our poor sequences. The people who are sequencing rice, they thought they would learn from the human genome experience. And they haven't been able to. What they found is the algorithms that work with humans just don't even work with rice because rice is so diverse. So you think what diversity is when there is in this room amongst us, and then multiply that many fold, and you get to rice. It is working. So our story begins nearly 20 million years ago. This is what the world looked like. It was a pretty big disaster environmentally. We're in, in the process of global warming. The polar ice caps were rapidly melting. 
a few million years later, they disappeared completely. The continent of Australia was about to slam into southeastern Asia and mess up all these islands and, and create the Philippines. And out of this environmental disaster came a horizon. Just, just about in this region. This is the origin of horizon. Here's a timeline starting about 40 million years ago. This is the temperature being shown here along a, a scale that's not logarithmic and not linear, but some sort of complicated scale. You see here, Ariza originated when there was no ice cap at all in this warm period, about 40 million years ago. Then our genus appears about 2 million years ago at the beginning of the ice ages. We appeared about 400,000 years ago. Not quite sure exactly when in the period in between these interglacial periods and the, and the ice ages. And then rice agriculture started probably around about 10 years, 10,000 years ago during this period of stability. So there's been a lot of climate change throughout the history of horizon. And this is a very brief summary of, of how the genus evolved. Keep starting here, the ancestor in Southeast Asia, somewhere around here. All these different genomes we recognize from the AA up to the K, K's and L's. Um, these I suppose to represent the diploids, and I put in brackets the ones that no longer exist as such. But B is here because it's present in the tetraploid BBCC species. And it migrated from here to, to Asia and Africa and Australia. This first arrow showing the genomes that migrated, and the second arrow showing the new genomes that appeared in the continent after after it got there. So this BC is different from these BC because it's a, it arose as a separate event from the BPCC genomes that we have here and here. And in Australia, a new genome, new genome appeared. Finally went to, to Americas and a new genome appeared there. But what we still have is the majority of genomes being here. So we have the Southeast Asia being the central genomic and species richness. I've put up two graphs here, but they more or less show the same thing, counting the number of distinct genomes and the number of distinct species by region, with, with the genomes color-coded here. So you see with Southeast Asia, we have eight distinct genomes represented here, 12 distinct species at the largest only one area, with Africa, Australia, and America, each having their own distinctive genomes, but a smaller diversity. The domestication event, much more recent, somewhere between 10,000 and 14,000 years ago, it believed around the lower Yangtze River here in China. Uh, I've marked here some of the more famous, called archaeological sites, they're more or less tourist sites now. This one, 14,000 years, is, is now known as, as the oldest site with evidence of association with rice, not particularly rice farming, but certainly an association. And that leads us to the, the problem that we're always told about. Agriculture has reduced crop diversity. Partly because of this original domestication event, this mutant, the, these mutants required for agriculture, that the, particularly the grains don't shatter, they stay on the plant waiting to be harvested, was very rare. So the farmers found that mutant in one population, and by definition, you put through a very severe bottleneck. And, and they were gradually spread out, and the whole of rice has come from, from that. Well, we'll see, not quite that one population. And then there's been a second uh, bottleneck more recent through agriculture, where a few thousand modern varieties of Dati replaced the hundreds of thousands of traditional varieties. This has been a, a big concern environmentally and for sustainability over many years now. The FAO estimates that about 70% of crop diversity has been lost. The Swaminathan Research Foundation in India, they estimate, I don't know how, I have no idea how they estimate, but they estimate that India used to have 400,000 varieties just in that country, of which about 100,000 are still in use on farm. That's a huge loss of diversity if it's real. And yet, well, sorry, and, it, and there is confirmation of this. This comes from the, the Rice Snip Consortium with an analysis in Cornell, showing 
if you, you look at the SNP diversity of the wild ancestor versus the cultivated variety, we, we see much less diversity among the cultivated rice than we have from the wild ancestor. And yet, we see in some respects that the cultivated rice is much more diverse than wild rice. Here I've shown the standard deviation of grain length for each species. So here there's a tiger, and each of these are different wild species. And you see that the tiger is much more variable than any of the other wild species, which doesn't really match this idea that we've lost diversity. And look at this, cultivated rice distribution versus the distribution of all wild rice species together. I, I try to draw in here the northern and southern limits of all the wild rice species of a riser, and the northern and southern limits very approximately of rice cultivation. One species that occupies environments that no wild rice has ever been able to spread into. And I think this is an important thing to keep in your mind. Start, start thinking transgressive segregation. What farmers have done here is taken rice into new environments, generated new types of rice that have been able to survive in environments that wild rice can't. And I'm going to be coming back to that several times. It gets almost biblical at some time. If you want to look for something in the gene bank, I can more or less guarantee you'll find it. You'll find at least something different. Here it is an example of a variety from Nepal. If you look at the whole grains, they look pretty much normal, but you break the grains open and, and you find two rice grains inside one spikelet. We had a question about this a few years ago, and I wrote back saying, we've never heard of such a rice. But then Paula, looked, Paula de Guzman looked up in her notebook and, and found this, this one, which we do have in the collection. But of course, a lot of the interesting things we find come from, not from our own research, but the people that use it. And the ones I like most are where, where they disprove previous beliefs that there was a widespread opinion that modern varieties of farmers flower only in the middle of the day, and this is a problem for reading for climate change. But Greg Howe came along, Greg Howe, with, working with Sigrid Poyet, came along and said, let's see if that's actually true. They took 4,000 diverse rice accessions out of the green bank. Stayed in the field from 6 o'clock in the morning until midday to watch when they flower, and they found those that could do flower, open their flowers early in the morning. Some of them confirmed a lot of dependence on, on variation of temperature during the day, but it confirms the general principle that we, we can find variation for a time of day of flowering. Another one, a, a publication was produced claiming that every aromatic rice in the world shares the same allele. So of course, people came along from, in, in this case, from great quality and, and they, they're trying to tell us we, we no longer need to screen our varieties for aroma because we just need to apply the genetic test. We know they all have the same allele, so we can do the, the test, the genetic test, much more reliable and cheaply. And a lot of the ones that we knew to be aromatic didn't have this gene. So this is the result of that. They found nine different alleles, all making these varieties fragrant parts of the world that are not the normal fragrance alleles. But maybe there's even more than one gene. Yes, the, the concentration of 2AP, which is the main aromatic compound, the frequency distribution of, of the accessions that are aromatic, one grouping for the basmatic kind, and, and another grouping for all other aromatic kinds. So, so you see basmatic occupying this range of 2AP concentrations. Jasmine, the other famous one, is, is round about here, also in the middle of here. But you look up here, these, these are two varieties from Iran, more than twice as aromatic as basmati or jasmine. That kind of makes you think maybe there's a second gene locus involved, although I don't think that has been properly tested yet. It's still just a speculation of like this. Well, can kind of suppose there must be limits to variation, but there must be limits to variation. So I've tried to do this is as defining the universe of grain size, top grain length, the grain width, 
Uh, and these blue images are rather crude approximations to the, the shape of the brain at each point. But every accession we have in the gene map lies somewhere within this range. But then I think, well, what does it? I, I bet that if some breeder wanted to create a variety that was more extreme than th this, this ellipse, they would do so quite easily. It's been done by Simit for wheat, and they've created really huge grains, huge panicles that are way outside the normal range of the, the cultivars. And this, well, I have to put this in. Every seminar about the genetic resources has to put this plea in. It's, it's about not publishing variety names as variety names. This variety and this variety are both called Kalkam from Laos. This one with dark leaves and normal grain, and this one with normal leaves and dark grain. You wouldn't call them the same variety, but they are the same variety name. So. And these two also, these are also Kalkam. Kalkam with a normal looking grain and a black husk. How come with a black grain and a normal looking husk? These are four entirely different varieties with the same name. So please, all of you, when you publish papers, don't just say Pokali or Azosena or like, like a, um, eat. Give the source so that we know which particular one you're talking about. Which all leads to an interesting question if agriculturists reduce so much diversity. Why do we get so much? And the first two here names, I think, are quite important in giving us hints. When Charles Darwin wrote The Origin of Species, one of the big factors leading him to the theory of origin of species was noticing how much variation there was in domesticated species, species that are associated with humans. And Vandal also noticed that near the centers of origin of crop plants, that's where we find the most diversity of crop plants. And I think the key answer came from Stephen Gould, who was quite a popular writer, so I guess a lot of you may have heard of these names. And particularly his concept of punctuated evolution. The idea is that for millions of years at a time, evolution may, or may more or less be non-existent. There may be no change. It may be very slow to change. But then every now and again, you get a period of rapid evolution associated with the change of conditions. And when you think about it, that's what's happened with farmers. Basically, they've changed the rules of evolution. It's no longer survival of the fittest in the evolutionary sense, natural selection. It's now whatever we choose to survive is what survives. It's a completely different criterion for what persists. They change the environment. So they change the natural selection pressures. They reduce cultivation and weeding, improving the soils, reducing competition. They provide with feasts for pests and diseases and weeds. So they evolve faster. So the crop needed to evolve faster. They share the with their seed around, exposing them to different climates, different soils, different weeds, and, and different people's tastes. So that, again, multiplying the, the, way, the, the ways of the, the different directions of selection. And after moving them, those introduced ones then hybridized for local cultivated and wild farms. So the result was a massive generation of new diversity that's relevant to agriculture. And that's what's enabled adaptation to normal environments, that freeing up from the natural selection and recombining new genotypes is, is what's allowed them to take the range of the tiger further north and further south from the wild rice species. And I'd just like to draw the analogy, analogy with what we still do now, what our breeders do. We are sharing rice. Then we make our breeders make crosses. We choose the best progeny. We combine that with better agronomy. And there's your improved agriculture. So what we're doing now is, in a sense, just a continuation of what's been going on for 10,000 years. So yes, there has been a genetic bottleneck during domestication, followed by very rapid evolutionary radiation, with adaptation to all climates, soils, pest diseases, anything that's relevant to agriculture that's resulted in different places imposing different selection pressures has resulted in appropriately adapted material. 
which means the material we now have, the diversity in our collection is relevant to, to future development. And what I put up here is that this statement that the early farmers could create so many novel and desirable variants despite that bottom neck of domestication. How much more could we create? If we get rid of that bottleneck, bring in more wild species, genomes from that, that don't naturally cross with the AA genomes, and, and cross a wider range of the Sataiba varieties with each other, we could be even more inventive than these farmers who created Sataiba. But this way, yes, the difficulties. So I've said all this diversity is relevant to agriculture. It's important, we need it, it's going to be valuable. So what happens is people see the money, and when money comes into the equation, logic tends to disappear. You might view it as the pot of the gold at the end of the rainbow, which will allow us to reach that new wonderful world where everyone is, is wealthy and no one poor anymore. Or you may view the fat cat trying to run off with all, all the money themselves. But whatever, everyone has an opinion. This affected us in the CGI change process. There was a, a point at which Akin got, well, he was affected by how much argument was going on. You know, at one stage, he said the, the dispute over how gene rights are managed has taken more arguing time than anything else put together in CGI and it's out of all proportion to the amount of money that goes with it. Reynolds, he should have said, well, you're obviously not giving us enough money. But it, it, when it, it's an indication of how much importance everyone attached to it, to it. The result is that CG Consortium, I think, won the battle and took the gene bank. The gene risk product 1.1.1 is funded not from risk, but from a special separate gene bank CRP, which has been set up because the CG decided that the gene bank should be separated from the institute. Good decision or bad, I don't know, but that's the way the consortium is it. So I, I want to go a little bit at this stage into rights, because when money comes in, into it, you've got to think through who has the right to what. And there's a lot of confusion about the differences between intellectual property rights and sovereign rights, so I'm just putting this up here. So an intellectual property right is an inventor's temporary right to benefit from an invention. The idea is it encourages innovation, whereas a sovereign right is a nation's permanent right, not a temporary right. The self-determination gives the nation rights over everything in and from the nation. And the aim of this is to protect countries from outside interference. And this is supposed to illustrate kind of IP 101, the first slides of the introductory talk. The idea of IP protection is that it costs to develop a new product, you have a period of investment where you're not getting any return on your investment. And, and it's only after you've produced your product that you can start selling it in commercial, commercial. And the idea is that if you market it with IP protection, you can get back your initial investment rapidly. Once you've got back your initial investment, it should then go onto the free open market, you shall lose your production. That's why it's supposed to be only temporary. For a short period of time, particularly to your crops, it's about 20 years. After here, you should have made a profit out of your, your approved variety. And then it becomes really available to everyone. Maybe better to look at the other way around, that if you don't have IP protection, that's a very strong disincentive to innovation. Because if you imagine here, the, the inventor, is making this big investment in developing a product, then, but then it doesn't get any commercial advantage in selling it. The copy is a great advantage. The copy will just have a, a little investment to, to copy that invention and can then make the profit just the same as the inventor. So it's the, the idea of IP protection is to, to remove this disincentive to, to innovation. 